Okay, good evening, folks. Welcome to the first ever virtual edition of Potluck and Poison Ivy. We have a wonderful show lined up for you tonight. Uh, we're thrilled to be presenting this discussion on the newly revised edition of Blood in Their Eyes, uh, the book that deals with the 1919 Elaine massacres in Elaine, Arkansas. Uh, this is a uh, joint project that Potluck and Poison Ivy is undertaking with the Arkansas Peace and Justice Memorial Movement and Just Communities Arkansas, so we're very grateful to them as well. Um, as always, uh, we're gonna kick our show off with some music. Our musical guest this evening is the extremely talented Joshua Asante, who is a musician, writer, photographer. Uh, he is the vocalist and the guitarist and keyboardist for Little Rock-based bands Amasa Hines and Velvet Kente. So I'll throw it over to him now. Joshua, take it away. Hey, how y'all doing? Um, thank y'all for having me. I didn't know Dr. Mitch was gonna be here. I actually work with um, Michael Young uh, on the, uh, Michael Wilson, I'm sorry, on the documentary down there. Uh, I was a sound engineer and still photographer and cultural liaison for that documentary. Awesome. Uh, John E. Lang. Uh, he, he speaks really highly of you. Oh, thanks. All right, uh, this first tune I'm going to do is called uh, Lilith and Light Years, is inspired by writings of Octavia Butler, um, some of her space stories. So here's this tune. I'm something, I'm something, I'm something. 
percent. Awesome. Thunderous applause from everyone watching virtually across yeah. the uh, internet sphere. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Joshua. No, thank you. Man. And um, okay, wonderful. Great way to get started. So now we are going to get into the uh, first section of our discussion portion of this evening. Um, so uh, we are going to be discussing the 1919 Elaine massacres that occurred in Arkansas. Um, and we're going to start particularly with um, talking to uh, some folks who recently helped to create the revised edition of Griff Stockley's book, Blood in Their Eyes, which won the 2002 Booker Worthen Literary Prize. Uh, with us today, we have Dr. Brian Mitchell, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, and his uh, research areas include, of course, the Elaine Massacre and um, a multitude of other subjects, including urban renewal in Little Rock. We also have uh, Dr. Guy Lancaster, who has written and edited three different works uh, on racial violence in Arkansas, and he currently serves as the editor of the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. So uh, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Lancaster, welcome to the program. Uh, with us also, we have Lisa Hicks Gilbert uh, as a guest. She is a direct descendant of members of the Elaine 12, uh, and she also has worked to um, help uh, organize and, uh, and kind of cr create this, uh, this coalition of, of folks who are family members and descendants of the, the victims of the Elaine massacres. And so, uh, Lisa, thank you for being here. We'll, we'll hear from you a little later on. Uh, but for now, I'm going to turn it over, I believe, first to Dr. Mitchell. Uh, so, Dr. Mitchell, take it away. Yes. Um, if we're going to understand uh, the events that transpired at the Elaine ma uh, massacre, what we truly have to understand is uh, what happened to uh, the American South after Reconstruction's uh, failure. Uh, and what happens is uh, the elite uh, within uh, the Southern uh, community uh, need slaves. They still are a mainly agrarian society and uh, their revenue uh, was generated by agriculture and to have the same sort of wealth that they were able to amass so quickly um, prior to the Civil War, uh, they need black labor and they don't want to pay for black labor. Uh, so systems are established to return uh, the former slaves, uh, now uh, supposedly citizens of the United States. Um, they want to return them to a state that closely resembles slavery. Uh, to do this, uh, they use two systems pre predominantly. Uh, the first is debt peonage. Uh, we know that commonly is sharecropping. And on its surface, sharecropping sounds really, really uh, fair. Uh, the plantation owner has the land, uh, the uh, African Americans have the labor, and all they have to do is work the land and split the proceeds, the yield that comes from that land. However, uh, plantation uh, owners have a number of methods to ensure that Blacks do not get their share. Uh, they use uh, plantation stores and high interest rates, poor accounting skills. Uh, some actually starve their, their uh, tenants off of the farms just before harvest time. Um, if the tenants leave the farms, then they claim all the cotton as their own. Uh, and then there were, uh, there's the intense a sense of violence that went with that. If you went against the plantation owner in any way, uh, you were subject to violence. And that was state authorized, state overseen, and state assisted violence quite often. You could not leave the plantation in debt. So the system was meant to keep the, the, the sharecropper and tenant farmer perpetually in debt. Um, therefore, you were reduced from a person, once again, a free person, uh, to a slave. You were bonded to that land and you really could not leave. The other uh, form of uh, enslavement that was taking place was uh, mass incarceration starts. Uh, most prisons uh, during the civil, prior to the Civil War were, were virtually empty. They were small um, municipal prisons and small state prisons that, that seldomly had more than a few 
uh, hundred people in them, a, a couple hundred people in them. Uh, but with the 13th Amendment's loophole, and the 13th Amendment maintained that involuntary servitude in the United States had ended except as a punishment for a crime. Um, there was that, that loophole opens up a doorway for slavery. And all we have to do is be able to charge people with minor crimes. And this will enable us to uh, go in, uh, incarcerate you for something minor, and keep you for years in bondage. Um, it's under this premise that people lived following, uh, following Reconstruction all the way till we get to uh, 1918. And when we understand what happens in 1917 and 1918, uh, you understand better why the Black uh, sharecroppers were going uh, to an attorney and trying to sue their uh, planters, the plantation owners that they were working for. In, uh, in 1918, the United States would go off to war and it finds itself in desperate need of manpower. And once again, the nation turns to uh, Blacks to fill this void. And African-Americans are, are encouraged by this because they see an opportunity in serving in the war. If uh, they can be seen as useful, if they can be seen as patriotic, if they can see, be seen as contributing to the nation, they maintain that uh, their citizenship will be validated. And their leadership tells, uh, uh, reinforces this. W.B. Uh, du Bois and uh, Booker G. Washington, Emmett Scott, all encourage African Americans to participate in the war uh, so that they could share the fruits of liberty. Um, black soldiers go off to the war, and when they go off to the war, um, they find initially uh, that they're not treated the same as white soldiers. Uh, they're subject to brutalities. The uh, white soldiers are given the best treatment, and uh, white soldiers are given the best accommodations. When American troops arrive in, in the theater in Europe, uh, they're asked to join the war immediately because um, Britain and France need reinforcements. Uh, General Pershing uh, maintained that he did not want to divide up U.S. forces and parcel out U.S. men to be used as cannon fodder uh, for Europeans. Um, and as his allies persist in and asking for reinforcements, he maintains that he has a force that they can use as they will, that is disposable. And what he means by this force is African-American soldiers. So African-American soldiers are first in the fray, first on the front line, and they fight valiantly. Um, they are honored by both the British and the French in the war. And um, the United States General Pershing is very troubled by this. He tells them, you, you don't want to treat them too well. You don't want to, you don't want to use the word hero with them. Um, because when they get back, we want them to be like they were before they came here. And when they return, unfortunately, African Americans believe that they have earned the right to citizenship. And this is where we find uh, the men in Phillips County. Uh, men, many of these men had gone off to war and returned from the war and now believe that they are truly American citizens. Um, they're met with a very unpleasant reminder as they are being cheated out of their cotton. And these men decide to band together and form a branch of uh, the uh, progressive workers and how, uh, farmers and household workers union. And in doing that, they hire, after doing that, they hire an attorney to represent them and begin meeting secretly um, to plan the court case. Uh, and the suit that they plan to bring against the plantation owners. Um, what specifically sparks this, uh, it, we can turn to the story of one of the Lane 12, a man by the name of Frank Moore, who was a returning veteran. And Frank Moore uh, said that he had, he had planted his cotton on a plantation that was owned by a man by the name of Archdale. And Archdale had a strategy to get rid of the families. He, he would let them cultivate most of the season. And 
And then after, after the cotton started growing, he would uh, tell them they no longer had credit at the store. So the plantation, the, the tenant farmers now find themselves starving to death on the plantation. And his game was to force them to leave. And when they left, uh, he could claim the cotton as entirely his own. Well, Frank Moore is a holdout. Frank Moore gets sick and he goes to Archdale because he needs to go to the hospital. And Archdale refuses to lend him the money to go to the hospital. And he relies on his neighbors to assist him uh, with his medical expenses. And in doing this, he realizes the need for uh, a, an organization and community. And he finds that community uh, within uh, the black sharecroppers that occupy the same uh, county that he does. And they join together and forge his union and begin meeting secretly in the evenings. Um, with most organizations that African Americans have had that resisted white authority, um, they were rejected soundly by the white community, particularly the plantation owners. And plantation owners uh, will sneak spies into uh, the union. And these spies will report what is going on and where people are meeting and when they are meeting. And it's under uh, this fog uh, of spies reporting back that the plantation owners become aware of uh, the Hoopspur Church as a meeting site. And uh, police officers are sent um, out to the Hoopspur Church. Police officers will maintain that they, by happenstance, have arrived at Hoopspur. Um, but there's plenty of evidence that supports that these individuals uh, knew exactly where they were going and that the trustee was probably, that was in the car with them, was probably leading them to the church. Um, no one knows who fired the first shots, uh, but a shootout will break out at the church. And when one of the police officers is killed and another is wounded, um, the police officers uh, that get away will go to a telegraph office, report yeah. what has happened as an uprising or a massacre. And um, people will pour into the county uh, looking for revenge and looking to put down this revolution. Uh, the first people who are deputized are returning white veterans that have formed an American Legion Hall. Uh, some 75 of them are mustered up and come out and try to put down the union, arresting uh, the union members. But the telegraph has already gone out that there's a revolution afoot and more white men will be pouring in from neighboring counties and uh, as far as Tennessee and Mississippi. Uh, the U.S. Army will also engage as they receive a telegraph in Little Rock from um, Phillips County uh, to the governor's office. The governor will then contact um, the Secretary of War who tells him that he has to go through the senators of the state and uh, ultimately, the president will send 500 troops to help quell uh, what he calls a rebellion. Keeping, keep in mind, um, the blacks had done nothing wrong at this point. They had done nothing wrong. Um, and all they wanted was the same thing that whites want, a fair chance at, uh, at, an, at having a good life. And uh, they're met with violence. When the troops arrive, in Phillips County, Blacks are hiding in the thickets, they're hiding in the swamps, and they see the troops as a signal that the U.S. has come to help them. Uh, unfortunately for the hiding sharecroppers, when they come out of the thickets and swamps, they're cut down by the troops that are there. Um, if all of this wasn't enough, uh, ultimately the sharecroppers, are charged with murder and they're charged with night riding and planning a revolt right beneath the eyes of their white neighbors. Uh, 12 of the men, most of them leaders in the union, are, uh, are put on death row and the remaining uh, members are also given jail sentences. Guy, would you? 
No, I think I think that's a a, a fairly good summary. Um, something that I'd point out is that um, while Elaine, what happened at Elaine and Southern Phillips County was by far the worst racial atrocity that had been perpetrated in the state of Arkansas and some rank it among the worst in the nation. Uh, you know, it's on, on par with what happened at Tulsa and many of the other 1919 riots. Um, that there had been a long history of this sort of violence against African Americans uh, from, from the earliest uh, days of the state of Arkansas. I mean, uh, aside from the economic system of slavery, the very first lynching that occurred in the state of Arkansas occurred in 1836 in Chico County, a free black man named Bunch attempted to vote in the first election, uh, you know, insisting he wasn't a slave, he had the right to vote, and got in an altercation with some folks, uh, ended up striking striking a man, and ended up being lynched, you know, because he tried to vote. So there, there was, from the very beginning, an absolutely violent reaction to any assertion of Black political power. Uh, in the state of Arkansas. And African Americans, um, after the end of slavery and with the new constitution in the state, had succeeded in uh, gaining significant political representation in the General Assembly. Uh, e even after Democrats, white Democrats, regained uh, their power in 1874, Black political participation continued on for the next 15, 16 years, uh, especially in majority black counties in eastern Arkansas. Uh, what finally did that in, I mean, there, there was a, a long, uh, you know, campaigns of, of uh, fraudulent elections and, and uh, disfranchisement, but in 1891, the state passed an election law that made it nearly impossible for African Americans to vote, um, and and this was the the death knell of black political power in the in the state uh, for many decades. Um, that the the very last, I believe it was eighteen ninety three was right. the year the last uh, black representative served in the general assembly until the 1970s. I mean, it was a, a long period of exclusion. And that was in the General Assembly. You know, African Americans had had served at the local level as, as uh, sheriffs, so, you know, serving at the, at the county, county level. Uh, and in 1888, um, in the town of Marion, the county seat of Crittenden County, white Democrats schemed essentially to carry out a coup d'etat against uh, the black political power base there and rounded up elected black officials and drove them across the bridge to Memphis, warning them on the threat of death uh, against returning. And, you know, they didn't just round up uh, political representation. They rounded up preachers. They rounded up uh, farmers. Uh, you know, other local cultural religious leaders uh, and also excluded them. And, and this was a majority black county and they carried out this coup d'etat and they did it successfully. And this was, you know, 10 years before what happened at Wilmington, North Carolina uh, with that violent coup d'etat. So before Elaine, there had been a long campaign of racial terrorism. Elaine's kind of a, a peak, as it were. It's, it stands alone in terms of the level of violence that was exerted, but it doesn't stand alone. It's, it's part of a broader continuum of violence that had been going on ever since the first days of Arkansas. So that's what I'll add to Dr. Mitchell's presentation.
Okay, well, um, Doctors uh, Mitchell and Lancaster, thank you so much for uh, providing that, that kind of background, that history, um, sharing that with us. We're gonna take uh, a, a break and interlude here now, and then we're gonna come back and, and hear from Lisa Hicks Gilbert. Uh, but for now, I am gonna throw it back to our musical guest, Joshua Asante. Joshua, the floor is yours. Oh, okay. It, um, I was thinking like in the middle of a discussion like this, the music that I have prepared is like really, um, I don't know, it doesn't have a bottom in terms of, <laughs> <laughs> by comparison, you know, the kind of, the kind of weight of a conversation like a, a, a massacre of, of free people, of any people, but definitely of, of, of people who had their own lives that they were um, trying to, to determine. Um, so this, it feels a little bit odd, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, I wrote a poem for the uh, Times um, when they put out an issue um, to recognize the, the anniversary, the 100 year anniversary of the massacre. Um, and th there's a, a, a line in there that is centered on. What is it? What, what was the thing that, that that caused them to hate us so? You know, what 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 was the thing that fueled the rage? Like, was it the way we danced? Was it um, the way that we found joy in nothing and, and turned it into something? Like, was it as simple as um, uh, admiration turned into? Uh, I always say admiration is is the first cousin of envy. You know. So perhaps it was that, you know, the way that we persisted in the face of such uh, atrocity. Um, and I, I think that, that at the core of that persistence is love, love for self, love of community, love of, uh, of possibility. And so here's a, here's a song about love.
All right. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joshua. Um, man, that was great. Uh, Thank you. Man. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, so now I want to move us into uh, the second part of our uh, discussion section here. Um, and I'm going to start um, with uh, Lisa Hicks Gilbert. And um, I was hoping, uh, Lisa, that you could kind of tell us a little bit about what led you to kind of take a, a leadership role uh, when it comes to, um, you know, bringing the descendants and the families together. Um, and if you could just kind of talk about what, what, what your journey through that has been and, and, and why you felt that was necessary and important. Okay, well, I'm, one of the things I'm going to start with is how um, I learned about the massacre. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people who are doing work around the Elaine massacre or just people who know about the massacre in general, um, some people believe that those of us, I was born and raised in Snow Lake, Rashaw, Elaine, and I only learned about the massacre 12 years ago. Uh, and that's because I was on Facebook and looking for a book and ran across blood in your eyes. And, you know, I tell the story so much, but still sometimes I'm in a little disbelief. I thought it was fiction. I didn't believe it was, I thought it was something someone made up about Elaine and, you know, about my hometown. And just, um, just done when I went home a couple of weeks later and asked my grandmother about it and found out you know, it was true and it had happened. And that led, you know, just understanding the power of fear and just her trying to, you know, will herself to tell me about the stories. And I spent five years interviewing my grandmother uh, about those stories. Just amazing the um, amount of fear the fear that still exists in Elaine and that in the climate that's still there, the racial divide that's still in Elaine today. And, you know, and she asked me to not tell her stories or talk about them, or she knew a lot, she knew some things were going on in Elaine and just in general about the Elaine massacre and just asked me not to mention, talk about them. She didn't even want me involved in the work. And she asked me not to until after she left this earth. And, you know, she left us last year, December. And um, I started Descendants of the Elaine Massacre of 1919 Facebook page in March, and mostly out of frustration. Because I felt, you know, I was, and because I hadn't been involved, uh, I was down working in Elaine, at the Elaine Legacy Center, you know, because I, for years, worked with the uh, children during the uh, summer, you know, program. And so I was aware of the Elaine Legacy Center, doing work down there in Elaine, just volunteering, and was just frustrated that there didn't seem to be a place for descendants, that descendants' voices were not being heard. And I've since learned, I've learned a lot um, about why that has, you know, been the case, you know, about how, you know, there were forces in place that wanted to keep descendants in a certain position. And so I created the page and just started reaching out still um, to just battle that fear of descendants speaking out and, you know, making sure that people understand because of the climate that's still in Elaine and because of people's jobs, you know, a lot of people still work sort of in that you know, they live in the landowners' homes. They work, you know, on those farms down there. So a lot of people are still reluctant to speak out. But um, just wanting to give descendants a voice, give them a place, and making sure that even if it's through me, that they can speak um, and, you know, tell their stories and, at some point, I'm hoping that the work that I'm doing inspires them to write their own family stories, write their own books, write their collections. I have one descendant writing a collection of poems from all of her cousins about their feelings on the Elaine massacre and making sure that 
everyone, even those who write books, understand the transgenerational trauma that has happened to the people in Elaine, of Elaine, the descendants. And from my grandmother's story, I tell you, it's a heavy weight. It has been so heavy for stories. It's where I wanted to know whether some of those stories, I wish I didn't know them because it's so heavy. It's so, and, and one of the stories um, is, you know, Dr. Mitchell mentioned, you know, uh, some of the men, the uh, sharecroppers that were imprisoned and the landowners could, you know, they would go to the jail to, I guess, vouch for the, you know, the sharecroppers to get them out of jail. Well, a lot of people, and I'm, I'm sure these stories, some people might know these stories, but some of the stories my grandmother told me was it was on condition. Some of these landowners, when they went to vouch for them and get them out of jail, they had to agree to certain terms. They had to give up crops. Even had one woman who, you know, begging a landowner to go and vouch for my husband and get him out of jail, you know, get him out of uh, jail in Helena. She had to agree to work for a whole year for his wife taking care of her house and her baby free in order, you know, to get him out of jail and giving up their crops. So it, it's so many of those, those stories that are yet to be told. And again, you know, I was frustrated. I'm reading these books and myself, and I, at first I was angry, but then I had to realize I'm angry about something that, I don't know, can't be helped. You know, why am I angry at the people who I feel have freedom to write books without consequences? You know, and I said, you know, but without those books, we wouldn't know. And that's what some of us in the group, we like, okay, we're not angry at the people who we feel are free to write the books. We're angry because we're still living in our fear. We're still living in our fear. We're restricting us, ourselves. So I've come to realize we have to unlearn a lot of limits we put on ourselves. So, you know, and still just, just dealing with that trauma. And, you know, I was just traumatized by the fear in my grandmother's face when I first asked her about those stories and then just writing those stories, crying, writing stories, just crying, having to stop. And just um, that, that was just traumatizing in itself. But, um, and another reason why I didn't feel it was being addressed when I heard so many people talking about reconciliation and healing, reconciliation and healing, and you, there cannot be any reconciliation or healing if all of the people involved are not at the table. You know, all of the descendants, all of the people whose, you know, ancestors were there responsible for the slaughter of hundreds of, you know, men, women, and children. And I think when we talk about reconciliation and healing, understanding what that looks like for descendants as we try to honor and, you know, remember our ancestors and what they sacrificed, you know, you know, I'm still have yet so much work to do in Elaine and to do around the Elaine massacre. And I'm still learning, still learning about, you know, still reading and learning and just trying to bring everyone together. And I'm trying to do the work without being frustrated by the lack of being at other people's table. And I found out, I figured out the, re the place to do that, the way to do that is to create my own table. You know, I'm no longer feel like I have to beg other people to sit here, do this, be involved in different events and just create my, you know, our own table where everyone feels welcome and hoping that will encourage and inspire, you know, all of the descendants and especially all of the descendants from the other side. You know, I was in, inspired um, uh, by one of the descendants and another author, author who've written a book and work together on that book to, you know, facilitate healing and get that healing, get that started. And that was really, you know, one thing that encouraged me to start the Elaine 
um, Descendants of Elaine Facebook page. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm encouraged um, by all the authors that are writing books because the more information that's out there, and I know that once, you know, all the descendants start writing, start uh, being more involved, that a lot of, you know, a lot of stories are gonna come out. There's so much information out there that is yet known because there are so many families that have kept so many secrets. And uh, one last to end, last year, uh, Dr. Mitchell at the uh, Arkansas Heritage, the, uh, um, the Arkansas, the uh, trail, when we you know, had the dedication, at that dedication, I was after afterwards. I was standing and looking at the picture of the Elaine Twelve, and I was just standing there looking at it. And someone tapped on me on my shoulder, and they said, "Hello, cousin." I turned around and looked. I didn't didn't know who it was. That man didn't know him, and I said, "Hey, how are you?" And I'm just kind of looking. You know, I'm thinking, "Oh God, it's somebody I know that I don't recognize." And you know, then I realized they said cousin. I looked at him, and he pointed to. He said, "That's Frank Hicks, and that's Ed Hicks." And um, he turned around, he looked at me, shook my hand. He said, um, you know, I've been, we've been waiting a hundred years to meet y'all. He um, is Ed Hicks' uh, great, great uh, grandson. And, you know, he came to the event. He, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. He, uh, they know what happened to Ed Hicks and Frank Hicks, where they went, uh, what happened to them, you know, after they were set free. So we are gathering, um, meeting each other, you know, getting all the information about what happened to, at least what happened to Ed and, and uh, Frank Hicks. So that was one thing. And I started not to come to that event. Just imagine if I had not come and uh, how, you know, crazy. <laughs> And, um, and, and I, did, I didn't want to come, I did, was hesitant about coming to the event because, you know, I didn't know a lot about Ed and Frank Hicks. And I kept saying, I, said, I wish there was someone who really knew them to come and accept those, you know, those honors for them. And, you know, so we're going to keep Frank Hicks uh, medallion and then the other side is going to get Ed Hicks's medallion. So, you know, it's working out, but we're working, talking, meeting each other and just, um, um, that's been a beautiful part of this whole whole thing so that's well thank you lisa so much mm -hmm. for sharing all of that and for doing what you're doing i, I mean I, I can't agree with you more that we need these stories to be told and we need to mm -hmm. hear them so i i look forward to seeing the work that you and and the other descendants get get to do i want to go back to something you said towards the very beginning and pose a question to dr uh, mitchell and dr lancaster because you said about how you you know you grew up in that area your whole life and didn't find out about this massive atrocity that had occurred uh, until until much later in life and so I, you know that reminds me of course of I guess it was about a month or two months ago uh, uh, three months ago maybe even uh, time is a weird concept during a pandemic but um, <laughs> when uh, when Tulsa was in the news and um, Tulsa was in the news and people were talking about the race riots that had occurred in Tulsa and how many people who lived in Tulsa were unaware of that history that had also just occurred in their backyard. And so Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Lancaster, if, if you can, I wanna ask, you know, why, why don't we learn about these things? Um, and, and why is it so critically important that we do? I'll, I'll let you start, uh, Guy, and I'll go ahead and reply after you. Well, we don't learn about these things because the discipline of American history as taught at the elementary and secondary levels uh, was very, it, it was designed to uh, foster a particular perspective. Um, there, for example, Act 614 of, of 1923 here in Arkansas required that all public and private schools display the American flag and teach American history in every primary grade plus one full year in high school. And that history instruction was uh, to aim for patriotic goals to instill in the hearts of students love of country and devotion to the principles of American government. I mean, American history was originally taught for 
um, almost propagandistic purposes. And, and that's, that's continued on to the present day. And we can, we see it yesterday. There, there was a, uh, what, a White House task force commission uh, they're assembling in order to teach a form of American history that, that uh, reverences the founding fathers and, and is designed to evoke pride in America. And there's nothing wrong with, with pride and love of one's homeland, but, but the problem is that when, when that, that pride and that love can't incorporate divergent material, can't incorporate these exceptions uh, that call that framework into question. Uh, you know, it's, there's a, a metaphor we ended up using in, in the conclusion, uh, Copernicus, when he was uh, at the request of the Catholic Church working on, you know, a new model of the universe, uh, or to, to refine the existing model uh that many people who'd viewed the night sky previously uh had realized that there are inconsistencies that doesn't seem everything's moving around the earth right uh and they'd make little exceptions for this and that and and complicate their model more and more uh create little epicycles for planets to move in because they don't seem to be rotating you know it, revolving around the, the earth. Well, Copernicus at one point had to use 90 of these to try to balance this, this geocentric view of the world before he just, it fell apart. You know, the, if you're insisting on maintaining a view of American history that uh, holds up, you know, the founding fathers is emissaries of divinity and everything they they did was right and noble and all the leaders who came after them uh likewise trying to incorporate you know not just slavery not just genocide of the native americans but the ongoing racial atrocities that have been there from the beginning down to the present day you're adding on more and more of these exceptions and at some point your worldview is going to fall apart. You're going to have to find a different pole around which everything orbits. Uh, and I think, you know, the reason we, you know, haven't heard a lot of this history is because people don't want us fashioning a new model for how this world works. They want us to accept without question, you know, the, the older models and, and I think we're at a point where that older model is is really falling apart, which is why there's such a such a such an urgent backlash to anything that smacks of revisionist history. S simply incorporating facts like the Elaine massacre into that model will call it into question. Um, so that's that's what I think is in, important to remember. American history as taught, well, in, in some respects, history as a discipline was always, it started as kind of founded for pro more propagandistic purposes. Uh, history has evolved since then. It's, it's become more evidence-based, but, but it was about fostering certain mentalities. America opposed itself as a Christian nation and a meritocracy where uh, people find themselves in a certain place depending on their actions and depending on their virtues. And um, we espouse in our history a certain virtues to great white men. And this allows us to maintain them as figures that should be um, venerated in our society. However, uh, I grew up uh, as a first generation of my family to attend integrated schools. And I saw no place in my history classes uh, where there were people like me. Uh, further still, um, nothing that my teachers told me 
explained my condition in this country. There were huge gaping holes in history that were left unanswered. And what happened to the Indians? Why did they need slavery? Why did, where'd the concept of race come from? Why do all the black people live here and all the white people live here? And these were all just left unanswered. Because as Dr. Lancaster pointed out, patriotic history isn't interested in everyone's tale. They're interested in a nationalistic story. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the nationalistic story of our nation is one of white supremacy. Um, the overarching ideal that are espoused um, throughout our nation's history is one that um, placed white history above everyone else, right? Uh, the access to resources of white people above everyone else. Um, and black lives were indifferent, red lives were indifferent, Asian, you know, yellow lives, uh, Asians were all there uh, to be uh, used as a resource uh, by uh, the white populace of our country. This is nothing today for us uh, as a country. I mean, we're becoming increasingly more diverse every day. And this is nothing for our children in explaining uh, how uh, the nation worked and where we are and where we came from and how we got there. So I see it as an impractical exercise. And as early as this week, the president called for a returning to patriotic history uh, and, and not, ex not including a diverse histories as part of our curriculums. He also maintained that the structure, the very structure that has been the mortar and foundation of our nation, white supremacy, he maintains that that does not exist. There's no such thing as systemic racism. He and um, um, Barr maintained, uh, the, these are institutions that people have just made up. Um, and they, they know more exist than the boogeyman. And that, that is problematic because if you are marginalized, if you come from a marginalized uh, community, uh, you know that these forces not only exist, you know that these forces have governed our lives and our grandparents' lives and our great-grandparents' lives since they stepped off of slave ships. Um, at some level, we have to come, we have to reckon with our past. I know it's an ugly past. I know that, that there were a lot of things done to forge the nation that we all have today, but we gain nothing from ignoring those things. We gain no greater understanding, we gain no uh, greater uh, sense of community in our country if we ignore them. Um, it's time for us to reconcile ourselves with our past. It's time for us to atone for those sins that have happened. And in atoning for those sins that are, have happened, we lose that sense of communal guilt, which we have tethered ourselves to this feeling that we don't need to talk about it because um, there might be some economic consequences or emotional consequences. Um, the reason we don't talk about slavery is because slavery makes us uncomfortable. The reason slavery makes us uncomfortable is we know deep in our core that slavery was wrong. We know deep in our core that either your family participated in it or you were uh, suffering under it at some point in the United States. Yet, we can't talk about it because that means in some way we, we have admitted guilt and we have to fix it. That's the place where we find ourselves today. We can consciously close our eyes to our neighbors in the past, or we can uh, forge anew together. And, uh, I, I, like I said, I, if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have said we were going in the right direction with this. I am now not as uh, optimistic as I have been in the past in regard to um, 
how we record um, history uh, and how we teach history to our children. Um, what I do is teach difficult history. And you know, if you go to if you go to take my U.S. history class, you're gonna hear about Chinese coming over as paper sons and daughters. You're gonna hear about zoot suit riots. You're gonna hear about riots in Chicago, Elaine, Tulsa. You're gonna hear about Wilmington. You're gonna hear about slavery. You're gonna hear a lot of stuff that's very ugly. But for most of my students, they have never heard that message before. They have always wanted to understand how America worked, but nobody knew enough to explain it to them because their teachers aren't required to take African-American history. They're not required to take diverse histories in their college programming. Yet, we send them to diverse communities to teach. How do you teach Black children about America by teaching them a history that doesn't include them? How do you teach Hispanic uh, children about America and their role in America when you teach them a history that does not include them? It's time for us to start telling the truth and stop spreading propaganda. That is um, a wonderful, uh, thought-provoking line for us to, to end on as we approach our hour here. Um, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Lancaster, Lisa Hicks-Gilbert, thank you all so much for sharing your insights, your perspective, your stories with us. Um, I'm so excited that we get a chance to share them virtually uh, to our Potluck and Poison Ivy audience. Uh, I want to once again thank uh, the Arkansas Peace and Justice Memorial Movement and Just Communities Arkansas for helping to create this, this idea, this, this collaboration uh, to make this particular show possible. Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, musical guest Joshua Asante to uh, take us out with one more uh, performance if he'd be so kind. Okay, um, so is, I guess it's fitting that the last song that I'm gonna do, it's, uh, it references the life of a uh, a once propagandist who, be, who 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 turned into a truth teller that um and was was uh shot down for it. This is a song about um El Haj Malik Shabazz, Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X.
Joshua Asante, thank you so much. Uh, once again, thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, that's our show. Thanks for watching Potluck and Poison Ivy. Stay safe. Be well out there. Y'all have a good night. Thank you. Peace. Night.